FOSTube, it's Lee from Creatively with my attempt at a stitch with me. Um, the angle is going to be a little bit weird, but that's partly because I stitched sitting curled up on the couch at a weird angle. <laughs> um, so I am on the couch and I have here my orange couch of serenity. I've got my chart here. I've um, folded it. You can see a bit of it, but you can't stitch the whole design. Nevermore by Leela Studio. And I have a clipboard that I usually sit with my paper chart on or I can sit my um, tablet either on a stand or on a little cushion thingy. So paper chart, clipboard, my needle mine just sit up there. And I see that's just sitting on the arm of the chair. Um, coaster for my drink. And I sit squished up on the couch. Uh, Probably have to keep adjusting the focus because it's going to get wiped out. Um, I also have a lamp above my shoulder as well, so giving me a little bit of light. <clears throat> so here's my project. I have started the Raven. You haven't seen that. I didn't show it. I don't. Okay, confession. I don't always show you all of my stitching. I show you most of it, but I don't really like when all I've done is that. I don't consider that. I don't. I just don't show that much. Anyway, um, Leela Studio, um, the, never more, and I'm just stitching this in um, Gentle Art Raven. It is not called for, but I wanted to stitch the Raven. It is essentially a green tinged black, and because I don't want it too stripy, I'm stitching the whole row and then completing um, Danish style. So you can see I've got a partial, I think you can see I've got a partial row in. There is actually a counting area down here. I've fudged it. I'm, there's enough room to work around it but when I start the words I'm gonna have to count from here because this is all one stitch too far that way and then I'll run out of room over here but I, I made it work. So my raven down here is one stitch too wide but by here I've I've moved it over again so you know you can fake it till you make it. Um, yeah so anyway let's get the needle threaded up. So, for those of you who don't know, um, when you pull a strand of floss, there's a nap to it. And if you don't know which end is the smooth end, you sort of run your fingers along it, just gently, and you can usually feel one way is smoother. So this way is smoother. Um, it helps the thread pull through easier. That's the end you want to thread in. I I, this is how I thread my needle. I fold it over, just hold it gently, pull it through the eye and thread it through. So no licky sticky for me. That's how I just thread it. Um, my, my aunt taught me that when I was like eight or nine and that's how I've always threaded my needle. Works for most. I mean, it can get a bit difficult when you've got like um, treasure braid and stuff. But anyway, so I have my fabric fold, rolled up like that. And I hold that in my left hand. And this is sort of how I control my tension. Um, and so I stitch, typically I stitch from the bottom of the design up. But I hold my fabric sideways. So the top of the fabric is rolled up. And the bottom is to my right. I'm right handed. And I... Um, uh, so... While I'm stitching logically from the bottom of the design to the top, the way I hold it, I'm actually stitching from the right to the left. Um, so rather than holding it this way and stitching my rows like this or like that, I hold it sideways to me. So I'm holding my needle in a really natural position and I'm and I'm stitching this way. And I stitch my row away from me and then I stitch my row back towards me. And, I, and most people don't stitch like this. Most people hold their design vertically. But yeah. Um, that's, yeah. Does that make sense? So I hold my chart... The normal way up so I hold my chart so I can see it you know but I can just see if I have to if I see I've got a stitch a row of 20 across I'm just stitching 20 that way anyway 
Um, I'll start my fabric just by running, running my needle under a couple. And I usually, and I usually just hold my finger just on top gently so that I don't pull it out, I don't get a knot, and then I can just, I usually just do a little tuck in there as well. And I come up where I want to go. So I know with this row, I've just got to finish the row, I've got to go one past. Um, so behind here, this finger, my middle stick it up in the air, flipping the bird finger, just is sitting where I'm going to be stitching. So the um, this thumb here is sort of just guiding, pulling a little bit of tension. So I sort of hold, my hand is pushing against my generous girth, my tum, and holding the fabric in place. And then between my thumb and this finger, and these fingers behind, I'm creating a little bit of tension just there. And I'm curving it a little bit so that when I do my sewing stitch, I'm not stitch, trying to stitch a sewing stitch flat. It's kind of created a little a slight curve. And I get used to the tension of pulling through and I use my little finger kind of keeps the tension on the thread. Probably a little bit too much of a tail there. So I'm just going to sew to the end of the row and then talk about it. Hopefully you can see. Because I'm not looking at the camera now. So of course I'm stitching one strand over two and each stitch I do, my finger at the back is sort of moving, it's sort of just helping, I can feel whether the needle's coming through and I guess over time you just get to know the distance that two strands are. So I can just stitch the little scoop and pull it through and when I pull it through I just give the little finger gives a tiny little tug but I'm not pulling really really hard. You just kind of get used to the tension um, over time. So you're not having to pull too hard because part of having good tension is just having them nice and plumpish but not, not too loose, not, I don't know, not too loose, not too tight. It's kind of obvious really, right? So I've got to the end. So of course I've just stitched along. And then I'm just, you know, coming back really. So um, just gentle pulls through moving my thumb and my finger behind just along a tiny fraction as I move back along the row. And um, every now and then I'll split a thread and I've got to go back and fix, you know, pull that out. But most of the time um, my, my stitches just come through the right space. <laughs> um, of course, I've got to skip one here, so I just come a lot long take the opportunity to adjust where fabric sitting on my lap um, tug a little bit now with one strand it's pretty easy you don't tend to get too twisted you know with two strands probably a little bit slower I'll take a little bit more time to adjust um, but I might stop every now and then just let it dangle and untwist because you know there was a little bit of a twist so it's done twisting about four or five twists um, just so that you know you're keeping a nice tension on the fabric and just yeah stitching back along so with two strands I find with the needle I do a little I do a little when I pull it through I do a little part twist with my finger just to make sure that the strands aren't twisting too much but of course with one strand you don't need to do that it's it's going to lay pr pretty nicely most of the time. Um, so getting to the end of the row. And then, looking at my chart. Uh, oh yeah, so then, um, I know with it, so I usually take my hand behind to change rows, just because that angle can be a bit awkward for me. But I keep my elbows really tucked in and the only thing really moving, well, when it, the shorter the thread goes, the less movement there is, is just, I'm just moving, you know, this little bit. So mostly my elbows, my, my shoulders are relaxed, my elbows are relaxed, I'm just tucked in and I'm just 
keeping that I'm keeping that tension on the back so that little finger probably that's where the most stress is this little finger and that's just I can tuck it in but I get awkward there I just help, find it helps to keep that little fingers pushing against my tummy it's helping keep this this area kind of taut whereas nowhere else needs to be tight because this is where I'm stitching just helps me keep a little bit of tension in here because that's where you need the tension to get the stitches laying nicely so this row is just going to go all the way along um oops I've split the th I've split the thread there I don't know if you can see but I've not quite come up in the right spot but I can kind of tell straight away so just adjust and go back through so um yeah I mean, I've even managed to split the thread on bloody 55 count, which you wouldn't think you could, but I do. So, yeah. So, yeah. I'm just going to stitch. Uh, I've got two solid rows before I have to count for the next row. So, I hope this is working out okay on the camera. It's a very strange angle. Um, for me to be able to see that you can see and that it's not upside down it took a bit of a minute and I had started doing this video and then realized I had it I, I had it on camera mode and I, when I thought I'd push start to record I'd just taken a bloody photo hopeless right so yeah that is pretty much why I can stitch so much um, occasionally I have an accident and I come through and I slide under the thumb that really hurts we've all done that right so where I've um, given myself a, a bloody um, needle torture under the thumbnail that sucks that's like whoa that makes you feel alive when you realize those nerves are working but yeah I'm getting a bit twisted now so I'll just drop it and let it untwist I guess I can just tell by the way it's getting in, what the way the threads getting in my way usually it's got a bit of a twist on it so as I said I think in my floss tube that just now um, I might have said I might have cut it out I don't remember but when I'm using a variegated or over dyed thread that's not hugely variegated I often will just stitch the whole row Danish style because um, I like the sort of subtle sheen you still get some variation in shading as I've changed different strands but it's less stripey and gets a more kind of slightly faded hand dyed look um, and if you don't love the real stripey look I suggest trying the thread Danger style, so stitching all one way, or the you know the bottom leg all one way, and come back again. When the floss is a little more highly variegated, like say in here, this one here is obviously a lot more variegation. I then won't stitch too far, but I still will stitch usually up to five stitches, um, unless I'm in an area where it's suddenly got very dark because um, sometimes the variegation you sort of it can be slowly getting dark and then suddenly get really dark where this one does do that then I'll I won't stitch you know into that color I'll sort of complete the stitches and stuff so I tend to stitch um, yeah up to five definitely three but up to five in a row because it is quicker to stitch Dana style than it is especially when you're sewing by hand so, sorry sorry especially when you're using the sewing method than it is to do individual stitches you know and it uses less thread etc so um i guess you know if you're not sure have a look at your thread try different ways because there's no wrong way i've also used a variegated thread where i've stitched just rows of such vertical so i've stitched the whole row up and then back so line by line because i wanted i wanted stripes to go up and down the lady's dress did that on night walk down by the blue flower and on her skirt i did vertical stripes compared and then the cat i did horizontal kind of thing so i guess you just sort of fiddle around with the thread and 
um, see how it looks. But because this thread is very subtly variegated, I just want it sort of like a little bit mottily, I guess, but not necessarily stripey. And this is the way I tend to do it. Also, as I said, it's a lot quicker. It's much quicker to do rows um, Danish style in the sewing method than it is to do individual stitches, any other method. So, and I'm all about, you know, needles on fire. So it's just, but I mean, it's just how I stitch. So, so now that I'm shorter, I can just spin my needle a little bit to help untwist it. Because in, inevitably, as you pull through, th there often is a little um, twist on the needle and twist on the thread and stuff. So yeah, that is hopefully, I mean, because I stitch small, like I take up a lot of the actual stitching is here. It's a little tiny piece of the puzzle. Like none of this matters. Um, unlike if you were stitching on a, a large frame or a big hoop where you've got a lot of area to sh like, this is it. It's just, I keep my stitching very small. Um, so it's a little bit, it's not terribly exciting to show on the screen. We'll get to finish off. So off sometimes, again, I've got another row where I'm going one short and one longer. Um, so sometimes when I get to this stage where my thread is getting a little bit fluffy, um, and that can be a bloody nuisance. So I just often will just trim the very end off just to keep the end nice and blunt and reduce the amount of fluff that gets left behind. Um, you know, it just can shed and stuff, so. But I, I stitch quite, I use a size 28. Usually I use a 28 Peacemaker. I really like the Peacemakers. The eye is a little bit fatter. Um, so as you go into a higher count, it just provides a little bit more room for your thread to come through. And I do usually <laughs> stitch <laughs> until my end is pretty small. So, you know, and you, of course, your stitches get shorter and short, like your movement gets shorter and shorter. Um, so that's getting pretty short. So pull that through. Go under a couple. I usually stick the needle in my pants <laughs> and then that's my ought, just a tiny little piece. I mean, that's, you know what, not quite an inch. Um, and I have a little ought container over here that I put just a little tin. And that is where we're up to. Pull, a, pull another strand out. Feel, feel for the smooth direction, thread it. It's kind of weird stitching without any noise because I would typically have a podcast playing or neon or Netflix or something going, um, or music playing. And there we go, on carrying on with the row. So finishing and threading, the, the method I use for threading is quick and, you know, I don't lick, don't have to use a needle threader. It's, um, you know, eight out of ten times it threads first go. And my, um, I thank my aunt Anne for teaching me that method years ago, gosh, 40 something years ago. Um, she's the one who taught, oops, occasionally get a little knot, that's cool. Um, she's the one that probably taught my sister and I how to do embroidery and cross stitch. I mean, mum might have, but I don't remember. I remember being, um, so my aunt, my aunt Anne, my mum's elder sister, she and her husband and family had a farm in Taranaki, so often on a school holiday, because mum had to work, and so did dad, but we lived with mum most of the time. Um, you can see this strand of thread is quite a lot darker. Um, I think you can see. So I'm going to get, um, you know, a darker bit, because 
but you know. Um, so we would often be, we'd get on a bus, it's about a eight hour bus trip. Um, my sister and I would get on a bus and um, go from Fakatani in the Bay of Plenty to Inglewood in Taranaki and stay on the farm for a week or two um, with my aunt and, you know, we had cousins there and stuff. And we'd help with like feeding out and just whatever. But my aunt did a lot of craft and she taught domestic sciences at school, at a high school in Inglewood. She was very, you know, very crafty, like um, fancy sewing machines and stuff like that. Yeah, I do sometimes get little knots, so we just use the needle to help ease that. Um, and so she would teach us crafty stuff, so usually she'd have a little project for us provide some materials for us to work on and one I remember this one year and I might have been maybe nine nine or ten and my sister Megan would have been two years younger and she got us to choose a piece of gingham fabric and I chose black and white maybe I was a little bit older no, I think I was about nine or ten. And um, my sister chose, I don't know, she might have chosen red and white, I can't remember. And of course, Gingham has squares. And then she um, helped us design a border pattern in crosses. So where you would stitch on um, the white squares and then skip the black squares for me. And using crosses. So we used the Gingham cross, uh, squares as the equivalent of your four squares of fabric on linen. And, yeah, we stitched the design and she helped us hem them and stuff. So we made these little tablecloths. So that's where I learned, that was probably the, that's my first memory of doing um, a cross stitch on fabric. And and she taught us how to thread the needle without having to lick it, lick the thread and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that was um, my first memory of doing that. I'm pretty sure we probably did some cross-stitching kind of work in class at school. Like on, I remember doing something on Hessian, Hessian fabric, but, um, but you know, using yarn and goodness knows, it was probably a huge needle. I don't really count that though, because I'm not sure we learned any techniques. <laughs> it was just like get it, make crosses, but it wasn't really making something, I don't know. But yeah, the threading the needle technique is probably one of the most useful things that she does I learned when I was a child. Um, I'm just gonna count, because <laughs> you know, it's counted cross stitch. Uh, cool, so, um, quit. I've now gotta do a row of 30 and then miss one, so. We'll see how we cock this up, because we're bound to, right? Yeah, so what should we talk about? Okay, I thought that I might just talk generally about... Um, some people have made a lot of comments over the last couple of years about... I missed the... I split the thread on that one. Um, about how I, you know have chosen the perfect fabric or my choices are perfect and what have you. And I can feel like there's a little bit of a, I think people can get a little bit mm, hung up on or let fear of choosing the wrong fabric or the wrong floss get in the way of them having fun with it. Um, people comment that they suck at, you know, they're really bad at, choosing colour or they're really bad at um, choosing fabric and, or they choose the wrong fabric or they, and you sort of see that a little bit on some floss tube where you know, some floss tubers who we dearly love and love what they do but they sometimes are like oh I started this but I didn't like the fabric and then I started again and I didn't like the fabric and started again and I didn't like the fabric and you know, to the untrained eye, to the observer we're like, I'm like they, they look great, like it looked great in all those fabrics. And I think there's very rarely a project where I'm 
that fussy. I know when I chose this fabric, I did actually audition a different fabric. I had a darker one. Um, actually, and the reason I changed it wasn't because of the colour. It was a darker green. I had just decided when I'd seen Nevermore, I didn't want to do it on a beige or a grey. I wanted to do it on something a little bit different. I kind of like the idea that it's a bit different from what others might look like. And I had chosen quite a darker green. But I thought it was a 36 count and it was only, and I cut it to be the right size. And it was later on that I realised that the shop that I'd ordered it from had sent me the wrong cut, that oh, sent me the wrong count, that sent me 32 count, and I had only noticed it after I cut it. So I only changed fabrics because I actually had cut it too small because I had miss. I definitely hadn't ordered 32 because I, I never ordered 32. Um, I've n I never order a over dyed 32 fabric unless I know what the project's for and this was just you know an order that I'd put through anyway that sent me the wrong it doesn't doesn't matter but they sent me the wrong fabric and I hadn't realized till after I cut it so I had to find another piece and by then I had bought this bit and I was like oh that's going to look fantastic so I had to change the fabric because I had the wrong I'd cut it too small and it was the wrong count. I wanted a 36 or a 40, not a 32. Um, but usually I don't change my fabric. Um, unless I just see something that I go, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That is going to look, in my opinion, great. I don't want to say perfect. I do say that, but I shouldn't. That's going to look fantastic. So I might change that fabric out. And I did that with the 2020 pandemic sampler where I had again chosen a darker fabric and then you know six months later and I hadn't started it if I'd started it I wouldn't have changed it but it was you know kitted up waiting for its turn and then because I'd ordered just some bunch of random fabric um because you know, Search Witches in Dunedin had got some fox and rabbit in so I just ordered three pieces of fabric from them because I wanted to get some in my stash. And when this bit of fabric came in, I just was like, oh, that's gonna look amazing with those threads. So I swapped it. So I didn't take the other fabric out because I didn't like it or I thought it wasn't good enough. It was just that something else just sang to me and said, okay, you know, use me. But, but you know, when you're, when you're kidding, for me, when I'm kidding up a sampler, I'm usually looking for just something that's a bit different from what I've stitched on yesterday or last time or when I imagine I have a wall of four or five or six or seven or however many samplers. I don't want them all on the same fabric. I like them all being, I want them to be different. I want, if I'm doing red samplers, I want different reds on different samplers, but I'm not necessarily looking for the perfect neutral or the perfect red. I'm just looking for something that's going to be interesting in a different combination than what I did before or how it might even be the same combination that I did before. So I think that, so certainly from a fabric perspective, most of the time I'm just looking for something that's going to work. I'm not looking for perfection. And if I get a fabric and one of the flosses is going to blend in too much, either I just go with it because I'm like, you know, in the 1800s or the 1700s, a little girl doing a bit of stitching for homework wasn't didn't have a store with 800 different shades of thread at her disposal and a million types of fabric. She probably got given a bit of linen and got give, had access to some floss and she just had to make it work. You see that on some antique samplers where some of the threads kind of disappear. Um, but we have the luxury of being able to swap it. So if you're stitching with beige on beige and it's too close, just go up, go up a couple of shades of. It's easy to change floss. Um, but actually, sometimes that kind of tonal beige on beige look can look really lovely and subtle. So I guess I just look at it and kind of go, it looks fine. Like you know, why am I? It's going to look different from someone else's. It's going to look unique. Or even if it's going to look exactly the same. If that's what you like, just stitch on it. If you don't know what you like, um, and if you like, you know, then you use the cord for, I guess. But, yeah, I just see people throwing or getting 
a little bit caught up in trying to find the perfect fabric, yet once you've put enough stitching in, anything can look perfect. Most combinations are going to work. There is no one perfection, I guess. Um, I think we see that with the designers. Most designers the ones that you see in social media, etc., are more than happy for people to be drunk with power, as Janine from the Blue Flower calls it. Like, make changes, tweak it, change the colours, leave motifs out if they don't work for you, add motifs if they do, um, modify the sayings. Um, most designers are happy for you to do that because you're personalising it. And same with the colour, like, if the fabrics, I mean, the fabrics are so beautiful. So when I did, when I did try and kit up um, lighting the way, I wanted a bluey grey mottled over dye, you know, for a, that kind of twilight sky. Um, and that did take me a couple of goes to get it. So, you know, that's an example where I was a little bit fussy. Um, and worked with Catherine at Country Stitch to just because she had suggested her Halloween smoke, but I'd already used Halloween smoke for the Leela Studio um, Halloween Quaker, and I didn't want to stitch another project on that exact same colour. But I said, well, if it, if it was a little bit darker, so she dyed it a little bit darker for me. So, you know, it's a custom dye, and it, for me, was perfect. As in, I loved, I loved it. It ended up being really great. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was a little bit fussy in that one, but most of the time, I just go, hey, this fabric's going to work. And then these, you know, these threads are going to work. So have a go. Like, if you're, if you're hesitant, just have a go. And if you're not sure about changing colours, then just change a couple. Like, for me, pink's not my thing. So if, it's, if something had the, a particular shade of pink in it, I'd probably change it for a different shade of pink. Um... The Judd and Privé Cat Lovers is an example where they called for pinks. There are two shades of pink in that design. are just not my favourite. So I changed them. They're still pinky, but they're more corally pink as opposed to um, a cool pink or a baby pink. So find, you know, change two things. Pick a couple of colours and just change them. Um... Just tweak things a little bit. Um, charts where you only have a few colours or we like that Jardin Privé one, the Cat Lovers, has two shades of green, two shades of blue, two shades of grey and two shades of pink. So it's really easy to change two shades of blue. You know, you pick, pick the blues that you like and from, the, from your box of colours, a lighter one and a darker one. It's going to work. Um... I mean, the world's full of colour. Colour works, right? So just have fun with it. Anyway, I guess in summary, there is no such thing as perfection. Um, so don't get hung up on it. Don't let, your, don't let your search for perfection get in the way of having fun, picking fabric and floss and stuff. Um, I think I sort of learned that from scrapbooking where um, a scrapbooker that I follow, Shamel, she, when people, you know, when you have a stash, she said, when, when she's choosing, she has lots and lots of paper to make her scrapbooking. Um, I have to count this in a minute. <laughs> and in her search for perfection, she's learned when you're going through looking for a blue piece of paper, a blue pad and paper, you just pick... Stop when you find one that will work. Don't look for the perfect piece of paper. You'll never find it. But if you're looking through and you go, oh, that blue will work, just you stop and you pull that blue piece of paper. Then you start with, you know, you need a red piece of paper. You look through your red collection and you stop the, when you find a red that will work with that blue. You don't keep going because you'll just spend all day looking for perfection and you'll never get a project done. And you'll still have a stack of this perfect paper for projects that don't exist. And you'll never get anything scrapbooked. I think it's similar with these. I'm just going to count 30. Twenty-seven. I 
And I usually count twice, but I'm pretty confident that I counted that correctly. I'll just check. I should have at the end. Nine, and it should end at the very end. So one, two, three, four. And it does. So as in um, my rows start to not over... Oh, I don't even know what the terminology is. I'm getting a bit twisted now. So my stitch with me's ended up being with a watch me not stitch and talk about perfect fabric and stuff. But yeah, so I do I do really enjoy um having like I love I love colour and texture and I've said that a million times, but having I don't know, you know, even even if I have three or four pieces of fabric in different shades of neutral, I just love how they're different and they mean, you know, those three projects, even if I stitch them with DMC or Anchor Black, they're going to be different because the fabric is different. Um, and I just love having, you know, we're so lucky to have so many different options available now than we used to back, you know, even even 20 years ago, um, we well, certainly, you know, didn't have this plethora of over-dyed fabric in these small dyes available. But we had, um, I mean, you know, trying to get fabrics always been pretty tricky. <laughs> but you'd go down and you have, you know, you'd you you your half a dozen colours of Zygarde available at your local needlework store and sort of had to make them work, really. Um... I mean, when I was stitching, cutting up and stitching all my mirabilias, you know, a number of years ago, I had more Zweigart fabric, fabric available locally than we do sort of now, um, because, you know, no one has it. Um, I might do a couple more stitches uh, before I tie off my thread. Because, you know... I like to get my money's worth out of my thread. There we go. Tie that off. I'll do one more length of thread and then we can wrap this up because, you know, it's not that exciting, right? <laughs> Look, oh, there's that eight out one of those times that that didn't work. Um, so what else? Um, so a couple of other questions I've had of late have been how do I choose um, between? Um, oh, let me check where I'm sewing to. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, With how do I choose silk versus cotton versus cord for versus um, you know doing a conversion or changing and probably there's as many different reasons why and even I'd say there aren't even any reasons why um, it's just what I feel like. Of course I belong to, you know, have belonged to and do belong to floss clubs where you're getting floss, um, one, two, three, four, five, miss one, okay. I think that's right. One, two, yep. Um, and... Um, this beautiful, these beautiful silks or cottons come in and they're just like receiving treasure in the mail and they're so beautiful. So, of course, I want to use them. So, there are projects where, um, 
I'm just counting. <laughs> it should go there, and then I should have five. One, two, three, four. Okay, I'm not usually chatting and trying to concentrate on what I'm saying as well as, you know, like listening to the listening to something on the TV is nowhere near. Doesn't require the same brain function as um, forming the conversation, <laughs> forming sentences is. Um, anyway, I could go back now. Cool. So, um, so yeah, there are projects where projects where I would use conversions um, are usually, obviously there's something like, you know, a full coverage or a large project where you've got, I don't know, 20, 30 colours. Yeah, I'm not going to even try to do a full conversion for that. Um, but I might swap some threads out. Uh, an example would be when I did... Uh, long dog samplers hoity toity. I ended up actually that ended up being less of a conversion than I originally intended. Um, partly because some of the choices I made just you couldn't see them on the fabric I chose that um, Fijo by Country Stitch, but that's where you know again if there's a particular color that's not your favorite. Um, and a flower or something can change it. Um, a project like this, where the projects that call for, I don't know, 10, 15 over dyes, they're the perfect projects to do conversions because I've changed, um, I think this color's called for, I think that was called for, this is I've changed to another over the dye, this is a was called for a silk, um, mud, 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 what was it, mud slug, no, something like that, and I've changed that just for an over dye, I had a uh, thread works, I think, um, so you can have fun with it, you can change a couple, right, so part of that is just, well, let's use what I've got, rather than buying expensive floss when I don't need it, so often I'll, with an over dye, I might use, or a project like this, I might use three quarters of the colours it's called for and just um, you kind of look at the chart and go, well, what, what is the thing that's the most important or the most prominent? Like the house is often very prominent on a Plum Street sampler or um, or like the Red Deer sampler. So the red, on the Red Deer sampler, I had to pick a red I loved because that's such a prominent colour. And the others then you just pick, are less important or doesn't matter if you change them um so yeah I guess it's just like do whatever feels right sometimes the you want to make it look exactly like what the design is which is what I want to do with the Rosewood Manor Sunrise and Sunset I want them to look like I want them to be stitched as called for so I've gone out of my way to get the called for fabric and to get the called for floss and Another project would just be, I'm just going to make use all the beautiful colours I've got. So I tend to use projects that I tend to change the colours on. I'm probably going to have no more than 15 colours, otherwise it's just too hard. And, um, you know, projects where you need two or three shades of the same colour, that can be harder when you've got just random stuff in your stash. Prim projects, monochromatic projects these sort of gothic -y projects, they're easy to change colours on. Um, so, yeah. Very often it's driven by the fact that I'm not going to, not. I don't want to spend all of the money to kit up a project, especially where um, you might use hardly any of that colour. So Plum Street's a really good example. They have let's say they have 12 flosses that are called for seven of them will be used a lot um so yeah the big house and the roof and maybe the greenery and whatever and then you'll find some colors are used hardly at all so they tend to have little people so you'll have like eight stitches for the skin i'm not buying an over dye to do eight stitches of skin i'm just going to use dmc or another over dye that i already have and similarly, if there's just a little bit of their outfit, you know, they might have a, like a 
couple of characters might have a, a little bit of a skirt and a blouse and a little hat. You can make that work from stash. Either, you know, there's not such, there's not enough stitching that the actual shade of floss or the variation in, the, in a floss is going to make that much difference. It's the house or the big weird flower or the big giant raven that matters. So that's where you put, that's where I would put my effort and my budget into making sure that I'm really happy with that and then just making other things work. So it's, that's sort of my, that's how I go about it. But it's definitely like, um, there are some projects where I'm like, I'll do my own colours and I'll have a look at what I've got. And whether it's silk or whether it's cotton will just depend on which bunch of floss I can pull the colours from that I like. And sometimes I will mix silk and cotton because you can. It's all right to do that. <laughs> and um, again, it just comes down to what what um, what flosses I have pulled that I like. Now this row goes all the way along. Okay, cool. So we'll probably get to the end, but not back again with this piece of thread. Um, we'll do another needle fire row. So I guess that's my little ranty rabbity on about, it's not a rant, but you know, it's, it's, in most cases, it doesn't matter. Like, I pull stuff, I don't spend hours agonising over the perfect fabric or the perfect floss. I often will just choose my fabric based on it's different to what I've stitched on lately. Um, or floss, I'll be like, I don't have that colour, so I'm just going to find one that will work. Or I'm like, I don't want to stitch anything in that cool, that cool pastel pink is, is one of my least favourite colours. I like a rosy pink, I like a dirty pink, I don't, I like maroons and burgundies, I just don't enjoy that cool blue tinged pink, ugh, yeah, it's not my thing, but you know, if it's a little bit in a big project, that's okay, but not if it's the main course, <laughs> it's okay if it's a garnish, but not a main course, um, but yeah, so, I... Just like having fun. But I've had, I've received so many. Since I last kitted something up from my stash silks, I've received, you know, several months of silks in. And there have been some beautiful silks coming in from Silks For You over the last couple of months. And I'm really keen to kit a few things up. Oops, I've gone over my tail. Um, I'm really keen to kit a few things up with um the silks that I've got and yeah that that's gonna be fun to play with uh so that might have to happen in the next couple of weeks really we shall see but there's a few yeah a few little charts I've put aside going must kit up from stash um and I know that I've got a couple of projects still to pull into the mix I'm gonna nearly get to the end you know who'd have thought um yeah a few projects that I kitted up a while ago that I've got the opportunity to swap a few things out because I think at the time I even said you know I'm kidding them up but if other flosses you know by the time I started if other flosses come in that will work um or be a bit like it I think I struggled with a few greens and browns that I needed to, um, you know, make do with what I had, but I've got some other options now. So there we go. Another few rows done um, since I came online, and that's how I stitch. So that's, that's the Lee Needles on Fire method. Um, should put my needle on my needle minder, not on my pants. Um, and that's where we're at too with that. So what have we got? Probably mm, height-wise half the raven, but width-wise more than half of the raven done. 
and then um, so I'll probably finish the Raven and while something's editing and then start my new start for start number 20 I've forgotten now 26 cool that's about an hour I better get this edited so yeah I hope that was okay um, let me know if I want to do another one and I will see you all again um, next week on my floss tube ciao don't eat your needles rust <laughs>